Hello, I'm Dr. Matthew Aaron. This is the full version of the presentation that I gave at the first annual Unity and Hope Conference for Targeted Individuals in Boston, Massachusetts on October 21, 2017. My presentation considers electronic harassment, an atrocious crime which can manifest itself as a within-community form of high-tech terrorism. Based on the accounts and testimony of many victims, this type of crime has been in the making over the past few decades, though both the extent of the crime and the sophistication of the underlying technologies seem to have grown dramatically in the past 15 years. My presentation is organized around four topics. First, I'll talk about the possible technologies, criminal actors, and motives that may be behind electronic harassment. Second, I'll give an overview of the reported bio-effects of electronic harassment. Then, I'll discuss the untold costs of this type of crime. I'll end by commenting on key issues related to how we might finally start bringing this serious crime under control. Let me start with some background on the technology and crimes. For those of you who are new to this topic, it is important to highlight some key terms at the outset. The essence of being a targeted individual, or TI, is to be singled out for a covert campaign of persecution, intimidation, terror, assault, and even torture within one's local community. Covertness is a unifying element of these campaigns. According to many TIs, the terror campaigns are long-lasting and relentless. They even tend to follow victims when they move to new locations to escape their targeting locally. You might ask yourself, how can a relentless campaign of persecution, intimidation, terror, assault, and torture be carried out covertly in modern democratic countries? The answer lies in the criminal methods employed, which are organized stalking and electronic harassment. By design, these crimes are extremely difficult to document, and they are also difficult for bystanders to witness. I put both terms on the list because organized stalking and electronic harassment are sometimes carried out hand-in-hand -hand by the same harassment networks. Electronic harassment is the focus of this talk. I'll just say briefly that organized stalking involves a distributed effort by a network of criminals to surveil, track, and stalk a target, to make the presence of a large stalking network known to the target but not to bystanders, and to direct repeated acts of intimidation and harassment at the target, causing a thousand tiny cuts of cumulative harm, figuratively speaking. Electronic harassment involves the use of energy-emitting devices to inflict discomfort and pain, and sometimes severe physiological effects on targeted individuals. Electronic harassment can be carried out by a single perpetrator, acting alone against his or her target. However, like organized stalking, electronic harassment tends to relentlessly follow a victim, so it also seems to be generally carried out by an organized group of perpetrators who conspire to single out and harm their targeted victim. There is a large degree of consensus in the targeted individual community that electronic harassment is facilitated by two types of enabling technologies, directed energy weapons and through-the-wall surveillance technology, which I'll illustrate in the next few slides. Directed energy weapons are devices that emit beams or cones of electromagnetic or sonic energy to destroy, disable, or repel targets. For example, the U.S. military has high-energy solid-state lasers in various stages of deployment or development, like the one mounted on this Apache helicopter. The military also has anti-personnel and perimeter defense weapons that emit lower-frequency electromagnetic radiation in the radio wave band. The best-known weapon of this kind is Raytheon's Active Denial System, which can be mounted on Humvees or AC-130 gunships, for example. Sonic anti-personnel devices, like the LRAD, have been used for psychological operations and crowd control. As shown in this slide, the use of directed energy weapons has already started expanding from the military arena into the arenas of domestic security and law enforcement. TIs are generally not alleging that the same directed energy weapons shown here are being used to harass and attack them. But, based on the allegations of thousands and thousands of victims of electronic harassment, analogous directed energy technologies have probably been co-opted by criminals acting outside of uniformed military and uniformed law enforcement circles. 
Recent examples of electronic harassment in the mainstream media are the so-called sonic attacks that were perpetrated against U.S. and Canadian diplomats and their family members in Cuba. Apparently, energy weapons deployed covertly in or around hotel rooms in Havana were used in some of these assaults. Several victims even suffered hearing loss and traumatic brain injuries as a result of the attacks. In this case, it seems as if a large enough cluster of prominent individuals and their families were harmed that these events could not easily be swept under the rug. Many people in the targeted individual community feel that when State Department officials call these events sonic attacks, it is actually a red herring or smokescreen to divert attention away from the more likely source of these assaults, which is microwaves or lower frequency radio waves. Many of the reported experiences and effects of these assaults in Cuba are very similar to what thousands of targeted individuals have reported in the United States, Canada, and many other countries around the world. Microwaves are also radio waves. They're just high-frequency radio waves. So why should we suspect radio frequency energy as the most likely form of energy used in electronic harassment? First of all, many TIs report that painful energy beams seem to easily penetrate the walls of their homes and other solid objects when they are assaulted. Radio frequency energy is known to penetrate many kinds of solid objects quite well, whereas ultrasonic energy has a more limited ability to propagate first through air, then through a solid object, and then through air again. Many TIs also know that radio frequency shielding materials provide some relief from their ongoing electronic harassment. Household and personal electronic devices are often disrupted during the electronic assaults experienced by TIs. Using EMF meters, tri-field meters, and similar devices, some TIs have documented high radio frequency field strengths or power density readings at the precise times that they also experience painful electronic attacks. To my knowledge, no TI has similarly documented ultrasonic recordings during their electronic harassment. Finally, the suites, or syndromes, of bioeffects that are reported by TIs are remarkably consistent with known bioeffects of radio frequency energy. This is also true of many of the effects reported by the victims of the energy attacks in Cuba. The term through-the-wall surveillance refers to the use of radar-like devices for imaging objects, including humans, through the walls of homes and other buildings. These devices are also increasingly being used in law enforcement and emergency service applications. Individuals with training in electrical engineering can readily build homemade versions of these devices using off-the-shelf electronic components and sources of ordinary wireless signals like Wi-Fi routers. Through-the-wall surveillance technology is probably an important enabling technology for electronic harassment because this technology would allow criminals to precisely locate and target their victims right through the walls of their homes. Similar enabling technologies for locating and tracking victims of organized stalking and electronic harassment include methods for hacking the location and tracking data of mobile phones, hacking into home security cameras, personal communications, and so forth. Conceivably, a stalking network might even use a Pokemon Go-like app to display a target's real-time location to all available members of the local harassment network. Enabling technologies for electronic harassment probably also include devices that can be used as radio frequency directed energy weapons. One possible source of these devices is technology leakage from the military-industrial complex. There are also many openly available technologies that could potentially be adapted into harmful harassment devices and even weapons. For example, commercially available directional microwave link transmitters, electromagnetic pulse generators, Cherenkov generators, microwave signal generators, and radio frequency energy sources used in medical applications. On the internet, you can even find people showcasing homemade devices that look like firearms but emit moderately high power radio frequency pulses or beams. On their website, the group Citizens Against Harmful Technology shows what looks like a homemade radio frequency harassment device 
with this horn antenna for directing the harassment signal. This device is small enough to carry around in your pocket and use for covert electronic harassment in public. According to the Citizens Against Harmful Technology website, this device was accidentally dropped by a suspected stalker when he confronted his target in the victim's driveway. I want you to take note of the nested ring waveguide at the firing end of this electromagnetic pulse generator. The waveguide is what allows this device to emit a directional, non-spreading beam of electromagnetic radiation. Commercially available radio frequency transmission technology permeates our modern civilization. Following the military's development of radio frequency directed energy weapons, it shouldn't come as a big surprise that sadistic criminals have also tried to find ways to weaponize the silent and invisible RF energy that emanates from some of the more powerful components in this commercially available technology. Today's massive market of microwave generating devices and consumer electronics also makes it possible to build small, homemade microwave harassment devices, which can be concealed in a multitude of sinister ways. During my targeting in Vancouver, Canada, I experienced numerous instances of illegal persecution and felonious assault by large coordinated groups of assailants who seemed to use portable electronic devices to irradiate me in public with painful non-ionizing radiation. I call these attacks prolonged public mob assaults. Each time one of these attacks was initiated, it typically continued for 8 to 12 hours straight without any significant pauses, as long as I was out in public anywhere in the city of Vancouver. The electronic harassment device used by any given perpetrator was often not that powerful or debilitating on its own. Yet sometimes, even one of these devices could produce intense thermal electric pain along a beam that passed into and sometimes right through my body. For instance, I believe that some of the perpetrators had directional, high-power radio wave generators hidden in backpacks, handbags, or rollerboard suitcases, as depicted here schematically. Radio control devices hidden in the hand seem to allow the perpetrators to remotely activate the pulsed radio frequency energy coming from their concealed devices. Clearly, I can only report on my allegations about this electronic harassment technique since radio frequency electronic harassment leaves very little durable forensic evidence in its wake. Nevertheless, the presence of these hidden harassment devices seemed objectively clear to me because the energy coming from the presumed harassment devices was painfully palpable to me. Sometimes I felt like I could tell which side of my body was being irradiated, or I could even feel a trajectory of painful energy pass into my body along a precise, straight-line path. These trajectories seem to point straight back to the source of the attack in many cases. Also, I was often able to sense the beam of energy sweeping onto and off my body in perfect synchrony with the alleged perpetrator's attempts to keep their concealed device aimed at me as I tried to sidestep the assault or otherwise evade it. I was usually able to deal with a single microwave stalker easily enough. But the purpose of the public mob assault seemed to be to keep me continuously irradiated with beams from as many different devices as possible, which was difficult or impossible to avoid at times. The result of this mobbing was an incredible degree of pain, discomfort, and even radiation sickness, after enduring what felt like a covert electromagnetic stoning at the hands of a mob of sadistic microwave stalkers. It becomes harder and harder for a victim to level claims of harassment or assault as the stalkers look more and more innocent or helpless, and as they use more and more audacious concealment methods for their directed energy devices. Here's another one of the many audacious encounters that I believe I had with microwave stalkers, who are part of Vancouver's incredibly large organized stalking and electronic harassment network. In this case, I was smoked on my front side by a painful energy beam as a woman approached me in her mobility scooter. The woman was intent on steering her mini tank right toward me as I tried to move to the side to get out of the energy beam. I got out of the way quickly enough, but when I went around to the rear of the scooter, I was painfully zapped again on my backside. A few times during these public mob assaults or instances of covert electromagnetic stoning, I was incapacitated, paralyzed, or even dropped to the ground by an incredibly powerful energy source. At these times, it felt like my entire body was torturously electrocuted by electromagnetic radiation, and my heart went into arrhythmia, and I was completely unable to breathe. 
In all of these instances, a delivery truck was either passing by at the exact same time, or it had just come to a standstill near my current position. In one case, I was pursued by a truck like this in the dark of night, as I sprinted at full speed through a completely quiet neighborhood and into Vanier Park, fearing for my life and knowing that the truck was in pursuit of me, only to be hit by three successive, life-threateningly powerful electromagnetic pulses, which I'm sure came from a large directed energy weapon hidden in the back of the truck. I cannot overstate the torturous nature of these very powerful assaults. These were violent acts of assault and battery, and physical torture, which criminals perpetrated against me with reckless abandon for my safety and even my life. In fact, it would be no exaggeration at all to report these as acts of attempted murder. As long as I'm presenting possible enabling technologies for electronic harassment, I'd like to mention an alleged piece of evidence which I'm confident will be substantiated eventually by federal law enforcement, materials scientists, and microwave engineers. I allege that the drywall shown here is black market drywall containing an embedded transmission medium and waveguide system for microwave energy. I have a couple of good reasons for wanting to mention this material in my presentation. For one thing, I have many large physical samples of this material, which I'm happy to share with any federal investigators who would like to examine it. In addition, if my allegation is substantiated, this is the kind of physical evidence that would lead law enforcement directly to some of the facilitators and perpetrators of electronic harassment. I took the two photographs shown here under ultraviolet illumination using a fluorescent tube style black light. The coppery orange features on and inside the drywall, which have an unusual glittery quality when you view them in person, can only be seen under ultraviolet light. These features cannot be seen at all under normal white light. I allege that this material is used as a covert transmission medium to guide microwave radiation along the walls of an apartment or hotel room. Then, at certain points inside the drywall, and there are many of them, the painful microwave radiation is scattered as needle-thin beams into the occupied space of the apartment or hotel room. In fact, I personally collected the samples shown here from my former residence in Vancouver, which was apartment 1501 at 1189 Howe Street, in the Genesis Tower. I believe I was electronically harassed inside my apartment several times by means of this illegal black market material. I believe that the microwave energy used in these bouts of electronic harassment was supplied to the drywall by a microwave generator hidden behind the walls of my apartment or somewhere nearby in the Genesis Tower. For example, in a locked utility closet in the hallway or in an adjacent apartment. Over a period of several months, I was irradiated with energy beams emanating from the walls at low to moderate radiant power levels. When I sensed these energy beams as thermally painful points on the surface of my skin, I walked some of the individual beams back to their apparent points of origin in the walls. At each of those points, I found that I could eliminate the painful beam emanating from the wall by cutting a small divot out of the drywall using an artist's X-Acto knife. In the photo on the left, you can see where I made two straight cuts into the wall using the razor knife, here and here, after which I made this circular cut to gouge out the drywall at that point. Keep in mind that I had no knowledge of the brilliant coppery-orange fluorescent material at the time because I had only ever viewed the drywall under normal white light up to that point. I repeated this little experiment at dozens and dozens of points on the wall, and every time I found that doing so eliminated the palpable and painful beams of energy coming from those precise points on the wall. When I later made photographs and video recordings of the drywall under ultraviolet light, I found that all of my earlier gouge marks had these curious rings of coppery orange fluorescent material around them, as if the energy emission process resulted in the redeposition of that bizarre material on the surface of the drywall. When I started examining the edges of the drywall samples, I encountered concentrated points, or foci, of the same coppery-orange fluorescent material inside the core of the drywall. Without exception, these internal points of iridescent coppery-orange material were always associated with the apparent deposition of the same material on the inward-facing surface of the drywall. Here's another area of coppery-orange deposition on the surface of the drywall. 
I know from extensive experience handling and examining this drywall that if I were to carefully dig into the core of the drywall here, I would uncover another internal point of the coppery orange fluorescent material inside the drywall. The core of the drywall is also filled with fibers that are extremely fine and fragile and glow under ultraviolet light. Those fibers have been broken off of the drywall sample shown on the right due to my handling of it. But I know from experience that if I were to fracture this sample or any other sample of mine, it would reveal fresh fibers in the same system of parallel fibers. I believe that this drywall material acts as a transmission medium or waveguide system for conveying microwave radiation in a parallel direction with respect to the surface of the drywall, in this direction. Then, whenever this conveyed or guided radiation hits one of the internal points of iridescent coppery orange fluorescent material, it's reflected or scattered, as a needle-thin beam, into the occupied space of the apartment, hotel room, or other dwelling space. As the reflected or scattered energy passes out of the drywall, I think that some of the same coppery orange fluorescent material is redeposited in little rings around the points of emission. In addition to apartment 1501 at 1189 Howe Street, I also encountered this illegal sinister garbage at two other locations in Vancouver, where I was electronically harassed by beams of energy emanating from the walls. One place was room 2209 of the Coast Plaza Hotel and Suites, located at 1763 Comox Street, where I also collected physical samples of this evidence. The other place was the apartment of my former friend, who lives in Hornby Court Apartments, located at 1330 Hornby Street. This person turned out to be part of the Vancouver Harassment Network. He works as an interior designer for the condo remodeling company Maison d'Etre, which may be how he came to find out about the use of this illegal material for electronic harassment in Vancouver. These additional observations give me the strong impression that this form of electronic harassment is widespread in Vancouver. If I'm correct about this assertion, there may be a trail of key physical evidence in apartments and hotel rooms scattered around Vancouver. This evidence may be very useful to federal investigators and law enforcement once they decide to start giving this atrocious crime the serious attention it deserves. As a warning to anyone who thinks they might be under low-intensity harassment from this illegal building material, I know from personal experience that this transmission medium incorporated into ordinary-looking drywall can handle a tremendous load of microwave energy. In the last microwave attack that was perpetrated against me by means of this material, the criminals carrying out the attack instantly stepped up the radiant power of their microwave generator to what felt like orders of magnitude more power than any prior attack. The radiant power level of the attack was extremely painful. The attack was nearly incapacitating and it seemed imminently life-threatening, which is why I quickly tore down several large pieces of the drywall. As I did this, I could tell that I was completely disabling all the energy coming from each piece of drywall that I removed from the walls. This reasonable act of self-defense allowed me to endure the sadistic criminal assault inside my apartment without fleeing onto the street, where I had been experiencing an escalating pattern of very dangerous directed energy assaults. Early the next morning, I abandoned my apartment and nearly all of my belongings for good and fled Canada soon thereafter. Of course, I didn't leave without many large samples of this key drywall evidence, which are safely stored in several secure locations. Who are the suspected criminals behind organized stalking and electronic harassment? In all of the conversations I've had with targeted individuals and from all of the online testimonies that I've heard from victims, I discern three basic categories of criminal actors or perpetrators of these crimes. One possibility expressed by many TIs is that elements of government are ultimately orchestrating the widespread citizen targeting that is going on today. Many feel that organized stalking and electronic harassment are ultimately being funded and run as secret programs within the military or intelligence agencies or their private contractors. Some TIs believe that they are non-consensual test subjects in programs for investigating the bio-effects of radio frequency directed energy weapons. Development programs for these weapons are known to be receiving huge amounts of government funding at present. 
Others believe that organized stalking and electronic harassment are community-level manifestations of an illegal homeland defense program, which is being used for extrajudicial law enforcement and corrupt social control. These suspicions deserve consideration and eventually a congressional investigation for a number of good reasons. For example, the sheer size and scope of organized stalking and electronic harassment implicate the possible involvement of a secret government program, or the involvement of certain government officials who are misusing their positions of power and their resources. Also, TIs commonly report that some local police officers and other emergency service personnel take part in their harassment and stalking, even though these individuals are paid with tax dollars and are supposed to be protecting people's rights and safety. This was also true in Vancouver, where I was harassed in very bizarre and criminal ways by four identifiable Vancouver police officers and five identifiable Providence Healthcare paramedics. These incidents of harassment were unlike anything I've ever experienced before anywhere in the world, and they all occurred immediately after I was criminally assaulted with an incredibly powerful directed energy weapon. I would like to make it clear that I have no reason to believe that all or even most police officers, firefighters, and paramedics are taking part in this criminal behavior, but it only takes a few corrupt rotten apples to spoil people's trust in these professions. People are also inclined to believe that elements of government may be involved because the United States has a history of very twisted non-consensual experimentation by the CIA, which is documented as having occurred in the recent past and could very well be continuing. Finally, the relevant institutions in law enforcement and government have refused to do anything to curtail or even recognize organized stalking and electronic harassment. It's no wonder that people suspect direct government involvement at some level. Another possibility is that organized crime syndicates and the criminal elite within local communities are the ultimate drivers of organized stalking and electronic harassment. Business leaders with criminal intent in multinational corporations would also have the resources and connections to run large and powerful harassment networks in multiple locations. The participation of police officers and other emergency service personnel in these harassment networks is also consistent with the view that organized crime and the criminal elite may be behind organized stalking and electronic harassment. Organized crime has always been and always will be facilitated by corrupt cops and other officials, for example, and the crimes of organized stalking and electronic harassment should be no different. Cops, firefighters, and paramedics are people too. Just because they wear a badge and nominally work to uphold the law or keep people safe doesn't mean that these individuals have higher ethical standards and integrity, on average, than other members of society. Police officers and other emergency service personnel can be corrupted just as easily as other people if the kickbacks are high enough, and organized harassment networks would certainly regard members of the emergency services as high-value recruits. Under the scenario in which organized crime and the criminal elite are behind organized stalking and electronic harassment, one can think of any number of lucrative motives behind these crimes. Just use your imagination. The possibilities are too numerous to mention exhaustively. Organized stalking and electronic harassment are extremely intimidating and coercive. At present, they are the perfect crimes because law enforcement is not even willing to acknowledge their existence. You need muscle for your regional drug dealing or racketeering operation? Why use thugs with guns when thugs with directed energy weapons can achieve the same effects without any risk of getting caught? You want to advertise lucrative services on the dark web to intimidate and harm people and destroy their lives for profit? Why perpetrate property destruction, overt threats, or traditional assault and battery when you can destroy somebody's life covertly and torture them relentlessly with directed energy weapons? You want to force evictions, influence the real estate market, coerce politicians, corruptly influence lucrative contract deals, destroy your competition in the business world, or run a protection racket? All of these crimes can be profitable, and a large and well-armed organized stalking and electronic harassment network provides the perfect means to carry them out. There's a third possible category of perpetrators, which is especially applicable to the street-level stalkers, or those who take up long-term posts next to the homes of targeted individuals to continually harass and harm them with radiation devices. I'm referring to the lower-level members of a harassment network, who are easily manipulated into spending their time sadistically tormenting and torturing complete strangers. When recruited, 
These quote-unquote ordinary members of society may feel that they are joining some kind of real-life gaming club, secret society, or sadistic terror cult of abuse and dominance. History has shown us again and again that ordinary members of society can engage in extraordinary acts of sadism, abuse, and barbarity, especially when they're manipulated by authority figures, or their barbaric acts can be done remotely and anonymously, with essentially no chance of being exposed as the antisocial criminals that they are. Many credible TIs report that huge numbers of perpetrators work together to gang-stalk them in public at times, and that these perpetrators seem to have a robotic, cult-like devotion to terrorizing and harming innocent people. It's hard to believe that a harassment network could afford to pay every last stalker to spend so much of their time harassing others. Instead, an almost cult-like loyalty, and perhaps fear of the cult itself, seem to drive the stalker's abuse of others. Many people who are tapped into a secret society of community-level control, or a gaming network for real-life harassment, or an underground terror cult of abuse and dominance, may have no idea of the cult's size or criminality at first. Joining a harassment network as a curious, low-level perpetrator must be a one-way street for these brainless, antisocial idiots. Once anyone realizes the full extent of evil they've become involved in, defection will seem like an impossible feat, because defection would likely result in having one's life destroyed by the full force of the harassment network. These three categories of possible perpetrators are not mutually exclusive. As I see it, all three elements probably contribute to organized stalking and electronic harassment to a greater or lesser extent. Regardless of who's carrying them out, the acts being committed are highly organized, and there's no doubt that the criminal acts are felony violations of serious laws. Accordingly, I believe that it's most accurate and most constructive for activism purposes to view the perpetrators as members of organized crime networks. As with all organized crime, profits must be the ultimate driving force behind organized stalking and electronic harassment, even if many victims are selected at random for sadistic fun, target practice, or just to instill fear in the brainwashed low-level members of the network. When people in government positions participate in or corruptly facilitate these criminal activities, they're abusing their positions of authority for the sake of organized crime. Organized crime is still an apt description of this illegal activity, and organized crime is a better framework for reaching the general public and the non-corrupted officials in law enforcement and government. In my view, organized crime well characterizes the upper levels of a typical harassment network, whereas cult-like loyalty or under-the-table wages are probably the driving motives for those at the lower rungs of a harassment network. Although I emphasize these two elements as most important, elements of government have also earned their place on this diagram. At the very least, the government is guilty of willfully neglecting this very serious problem when the government is actually supposed to work for the people and protect their safety and rights first and foremost. Given the surge in development of directed energy weapons and through-the-wall imaging systems, there's no excuse for the government not to have foreseen the growth of serious organized crime using these same technologies. Many people at all levels of law enforcement and government know that organized stalking and electronic harassment are in full swing and rapidly growing out of control. Yet, the government continues to ignore the problem and even deny its existence, which is willful neglect of a problem that will inevitably turn into the forefront human rights issue of the 21st century. If you recall the beginning of my talk, I also referred to electronic harassment as a new form of high-tech terrorism. I think terrorism is a valid descriptor of electronic harassment, much like terrorism is an apt description of the activities of the Ku Klux Klan. Clearly, the aim of electronic harassment is to terrorize, persecute, and torture targeted victims. In addition, the perpetrators of this crime use high-tech weapons that are so terrifying and destructive that even the relevant government institutions won't acknowledge their existence or use in civilian settings. Once the use of these weapons on civilians becomes known by the general public, the consensus will be that these are weapons of terror, and that the criminals using them are domestic terrorists. We may need a new term for this organized crime of terror, because it is unlike traditional forms of terrorism in one key way. 
The perpetrators of electronic harassment don't seem to have any particular ideology or agenda, like other terrorists do. Unless subverting the rule of law, psychopathically inflicting pain on helpless victims, and narcissistically promoting anarchy and chaos make up their agenda. The diagram shown here portrays the likely structure of a within-community organized stalking and electronic harassment network. A comparatively small number of people from the local criminal elite may compose the top leadership of a community-level harassment network. Targets are most likely identified to subordinates by this top tier of leadership, or by lower-ranking leaders, labeled captains in this diagram. Many targeted individuals may be for-profit targets. Clients who pay to have these targeted victims harassed, assaulted, or tortured electromagnetically may only interact with the top leadership to insulate the client's identities from the rest of the harassment network. Alternatively, perhaps only second-tier officers interact with outside clients to protect the identities of the top leaders from ever being known outside the harassment network. While most targets are almost certainly chosen for profit, there may also be targets of opportunity which are used for sadistic entertainment, target practice, or to showcase or test newly built or acquired electromagnetic harassment devices. Below the leadership, there are probably different levels of criminal thugs who carry out the dirty work against pre-selected targets. Only trusted, high-ranking stalkers may be allowed to deploy the most high-tech or powerful directed energy weapons against targets. This may include any classified weapons leaked from the military-industrial complex and any through-wall radar devices borrowed or stolen from police or fire departments. Lower-level stalkers may be allowed to use cruder, homemade devices for mob attacks on victims in public because these devices are less likely to be recognized as weapons or criminal harassment devices, even if they are discovered and confiscated by non-corrupted police officers. At the very bottom of these organizations are the surveillance role players, street theater actors, street level informants, and unarmed gang stalkers. One level above them are the handlers. These individuals manage the street level informants and gang stalkers. They probably also orchestrate and monitor organized stalking activities, psychological operations, and the intimidating street theater that is performed around unfortunate victims on the target list. Handlers may be responsible for keeping tabs on targets' whereabouts, their states of mind, and their reactions to the organized stalking and electronic harassment. Handlers may also be responsible for reporting this information to the organization's leadership. Given the seriousness and scope of these crimes, the harassment network is probably highly compartmentalized, both across hierarchical levels and even within the lower levels. Any criminal associate within the organization may only know a fraction of criminals at their same level, and they may only ever interact with one or a few individuals at the level immediately above them. The benefits of this compartmentalization are obvious. It would keep associates at the bottom levels from knowing the full extent of what they're involved in. It would also make it harder for whistleblowers, defectors, or undercover law enforcement agents to know about the leadership their racketeering activities, or the size of the syndicate's directed energy weapon arsenal. Corrupt first responders who aid and abet the organized crime group and receive kickbacks for doing so may be linked to the criminal organization at any of the different levels. In general, however, they may be affiliated with lower levels of the organized crime group to keep corrupt law enforcement in the dark about the extensive crimes they're facilitating and to insulate the identities of the group's leaders from anyone in the local police force, whether corrupt or not. This slide schematically illustrates the spread of within-community and regional harassment networks over the past few decades, as well as the current extent of this problem across North America. A similar picture has emerged in all other modern democratic countries. I acknowledge that this diagram is conceptual. While the diagram is not based on actual survey data, the situation portrayed here is derived from the testimonies of many credible victims regarding the geographical extent of organized stalking and electronic harassment. Over the past 15 years, community and regional harassment networks of different sizes and areas of geographic coverage seem to have sprung up all over North America. Disturbingly, many TIs report that when they travel from one location to another, 
Sometimes across large distances or even internationally, the harassment continues at their new location after only a slight delay or no delay at all. These dotted red lines don't necessarily indicate that the victims were actively followed by their local stalkers to the target's destinations, though there are reports of that happening. Instead, the lines are mainly meant to represent accounts in which targets describe moving to new locations and immediately or quickly being harassed and electromagnetically assaulted by criminals who were already in place at the new locations. These reports make it seem like some TIs are on a kind of target list that's shared among community-level harassment networks in different regions or countries. In other words, many of the community-level crime groups that target people with organized stalking and energy weapon attacks appear to be linked or networked into regional or transnational crime organizations. At the same time, many of the local harassment networks may be single community organized crime groups, which work in isolation from other harassment networks. There may also be community harassment groups that are only networked into regional crime syndicates of intermediate size. Because this problem has been neglected and even denied by authorities for so long, the criminal harassment groups have had free reign to operate with impunity, to refine their criminal methods, and to network broadly with one another. This regional and international networking could have been facilitated by a number of factors. These factors include the following the possible involvement of transnational corporations or international crime syndicates that predate electronic harassment, the use of shared criminal marketplaces for energy weapons, and the transmission of a shared criminal culture on dark web channels, possibly even on dark internet forums dedicated to organized stalking, partnerships among intelligence agencies or secret government programs operating in allied nations, or a combination of these factors. One thing is clear, the world now has a massive socio-criminal problem on its hands. That problem is the interconnected crime of organized stalking and electronic harassment. At this point, I'd like to discuss the bioeffects of radio frequency harassment devices and directed energy weapons. The TI community is anxiously awaiting quantitative data from the Global Survey of Electronic Harassment Bioeffects being conducted by former NSA analysts William Binney and J. Kirk Wiebe. Even before those data become available, a qualitative list of the most often alleged bioeffects of electronic harassment can be made based on the reports of several hundred TIs, as given on the nightly conference calls and in YouTube testimonials. The most commonly reported effects include the following. Stabbing jolts of pain deep into and sometimes right through the body. Unusual burns, inflammation, bizarre bruises, and other lesions on the surface of the skin. Highly uncomfortable and sometimes torturous electrified sensations in the body. Incredibly intense headache with immediate onset and offset. TIs often report induced muscle contractions and involuntary body movements as they are being electronically harassed. Sometimes these are reported as pulsating muscle twitches, and other times as physical vibrations throughout much or all of the body. In extreme cases, they are said to be seizure-like body movements. Many TIs say that they experience alarming cardiac effects when they are assaulted electromagnetically, including extreme racing of the heart, very strong contractions of the heart, noticeable arrhythmia, strong heart palpitations, angina, and even temporary arrest of the heartbeat. Another commonly reported effect is impaired breathing. Any of these effects can disrupt sleep, leading to severe sleep deprivation when electronic harassment is carried out on a nightly basis, as is often reported by TIs. Many targeted individuals have reported extreme weakness with sudden onset and offset. In extreme cases, this weakness can be so great that one is totally paralyzed and incapacitated. Rapid psychological and cognitive shifts are reported to be caused by radio frequency directed energy weapons, such as inexplicable and dramatic mood swings, which seem to have nothing at all to do with ambient conditions or visible behavioral triggers, sudden onset of fear, anxiety, or heightened states of arousal, including sexual arousal or anger, and impaired ability to think or communicate. 
Sometimes, electronic harassment is reported to be capable of causing intense, debilitating nausea, bowel distress, or incontinence, again with immediate onset and offset, perfectly synchronized to the initiation and cessation of palpable energy fields interacting with the body. I refer to all of these reported effects as the less exotic alleged bioeffects of electronic harassment. In addition, some targeted individuals report much more exotic effects, such as dramatic effects on sensory processes or high-resolution interactions with the mind. Auditory effects are commonly reported during alleged bouts of electronic harassment, such as isolated clicks, trains of pulses or repeated clicks, buzzing, chirping, high-pitched ringing, grinding noises, and even horrifying bestial sounds. The perceived loudness of these sounds can vary from just above the minimal level of perception to as loud as being next to speakers at a rock concert. Some victims report that they hear synthesized human voices, which can be heard speaking isolated words or complex sentences when there is little background noise from one's environment and TIs are not otherwise audibly distracted. Under electronic harassment in the dark or in low-light conditions, some TIs report seeing visual anomalies, flashes of light, coronal discharges, faint grainy images, including still images or moving images, or even fully formed crisp holographic images. These reported visual effects seem to be produced without any apparent light source, and they may even be seen with the eyes closed, as if the energy responsible for them can first pass through one's walls and even one's closed eyelids. On the internet, you can find TIs claiming that they have experienced evidence that their thoughts have been read remotely, and that these experiences are correlated with other indications of covert electronic harassment. A whole range of allegations by different names can be lumped under this category of thought extraction, because all of these purported effects would involve the remote reading of thoughts, or at least the very high bandwidth and high resolution extraction of data on neural processes directly from a targeted individual's brain. Claims that you might hear under this category include remote neural monitoring, or RNM, perpetrators seeing through a victim's eyes, or remote viewing, hearing through a victim's ears, and mind reading. I conducted a thorough survey of public domain peer-reviewed scientific literature to determine if there is any scientific basis for radio frequency energy being able to cause any of the alleged effects listed here. I have excellent access to this literature, in addition to years of experience knowing how to search and review the biomedical literature. I'm also good at interpreting the relevant literature because I have a master's degree in environmental toxicology from Virginia Tech and a PhD in neurobiology and behavior from Cornell University. And I have done published research in sensory systems, signal analysis, organismal biology, toxicology, and genetics. I'll start with the less exotic effects of radio frequency harassment devices and directed energy weapons. It's beyond the scope of this presentation to get into the details of the hundreds of relevant papers that I found on this topic, though I will refer to a few specific papers later in the talk. I'll summarize the results of my review by telling you that there's at least some suggestive support in the biomedical literature that every one of these non-exotic effects can be produced by directed radio frequency energy of sufficiently high power. The literature provides way more than just a little bit of support that some of these alleged bio-effects are possible effects of radio frequency directed energy weapons. Many of the non-exotic effects listed here are so-called non-thermal effects of radio frequency electromagnetic radiation. Many non-thermal effects depend on pulsing or other modulations of the radio waves at biologically relevant frequencies between 1 and 10,000 Hz. These low-frequency modulations can have devastating effects on electrically excitable tissues of the body because these tissues carry out bioelectric processes in this frequency range. Before considering the alleged exotic effects of electronic harassment, which I'll do later in the presentation, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the non-exotic effects of weaponized energy in the radio wave band, which includes millimeter waves, microwaves, and lower frequency radio waves. I'll start by showing you some of the injuries that I sustained when I was repeatedly electronically assaulted by members of an organized crime group 
headquartered in the non-residential building at 1190 Hornby Street in Vancouver, British Columbia. All of the injuries that I'm going to show you on this slide and the next two slides were caused by brief jolts of energy to my body, each lasting only a fraction of a second. I felt these bursts of energy as distinctive linear trajectories of thermal electric pain, starting on the surface of my skin and passing deep into my body. Each jolt felt like a big, hot electric rubber band was being snapped several centimeters into my body before all the incoming energy was absorbed to below detectable levels by the tissues of my body. In many cases, it felt like the trajectories of energy came from the apartment directly above mine, presumably passing right through the concrete slab between the two apartments before hitting me. In other cases, I felt lateral trajectories of painful energy hitting the side of my body facing 1190 Hornby Street, directly across the alley from my apartment. In one of these instances, I even saw an individual aiming a rifle-shaped weapon at me from the roof across the alley, right when I was hit on the face by one of these electromagnetic pulses. In one attack, I felt upward-oriented trajectories of painful energy hitting me on the bottom of my feet and other downward-facing surfaces of my body, as if a directed energy weapon was being fired into my apartment from the apartment directly below mine. At the time of all of these attacks, I lived in apartment 1501 in the Genesis Tower, located at 1189 Howe Street. The photographs on the left show my right ear before and after an electronic assault that seemed to be originating from apartment 1601 in the Genesis Tower, directly above my apartment. A brief pulse of energy passed through my right ear and deep into my skull. The skin on my ear quickly turned red, as if sunburned, the cartilage of my ear swelled up, and my ear was in such pain that it felt like it was on fire. It took two days for my ear to heal completely. During much of that time, there was a deep dull pain in that part of my skull. I took the photo on the right shortly after a rapid barrage of pulses was fired at me, apparently also from apartment 1601 at 1189 Howe Street in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was hit by dozens of painful electromagnetic pulses all over my head, neck, shoulders, and upper torso, though you can only see the injuries to my neck in this photo. Each distinct patch of inflammation was caused by a single pulse of energy to my neck. At least six distinct radiation burn patches are visible in this photograph. An especially powerful pulse of energy even caused the outermost layer of my skin to be obliterated or burned away in this square-shaped pattern. During each through-the-wall or through-the-ceiling assault with these pulse weapons, I typically received 40 to 80 pulses of painful energy to my body before I could no longer take the pain and had to flee the sanctity of my own home. When I did this, I often had to take shelter in the Vancouver Public Library or the YVR Airport, or I spent the entire night hiding in the two emergency stairwells of my building. Without exception, each pulse from this class of weapons left a visible lesion on the surface of my body, and there was always residual pain, and presumably trauma, deep within my body. The pain and lesions lasted up to two to three days before they went away. This photograph shows a bizarre, light-colored welt just above my right eye exactly where I was hit by a very painful thermal electric jolt of energy. A good portion of my right eyebrow fell out as a result of this one pulse of energy. Fortunately, the hair grew back. This photograph shows another bizarre, light-colored swollen lesion where a pulsatile energy beam ripped through my head at an oblique angle. I took all three of these photos as I was hiding from my attackers for several hours in the stacks and washrooms of the Vancouver Public Library. In many other cases, the pulses of energy caused bizarre, thin line bruises and microcapillary damage, which looked as if I had been tattooed by the assailant's energy weapons, like this one on my calf, and this one on my knee. These kinds of bruises took two to three days to heal fully, and there was residual pain deep in the underlying muscle, bone, and or joints for one to two days. This photo, tweeted by Dr. Katherine Horton, shows a directed energy injury that Dr. Horton sustained on her neck from an attack carried out in public in Switzerland. 
The perpetrators of electronic harassment often aim their weapons at the head, heart, and spine because the high-power radio frequency energy from their weapons passes through the skin and continues traveling deep into the body. Shots to the brain, spinal cord, and heart are particularly damaging because the pulsed radio frequency energy can have devastating effects on these electrically active tissues. It's pretty clear that the assailants know this and that their aim is to cause maximal trauma and damage to their victims. The perpetrators of this kind of crime also go for other particularly sensitive, susceptible, or violating areas of the body, such as the eyes, feet, hands, anus, genitals, and breasts. It is also especially painful when radio frequency energy bursts or sustained beams penetrate bone. This photo shows what looks like skin and connective tissue damage to the right foot of a female targeted individual who lives near Portland, Oregon. This person reports chronic and very painful selective targeting of her right foot, which is typically more exposed than her left foot, given her habitual sleeping position. Note how much better her left foot looks, which the victim reports as being seldom hit by electrically painful and thermally warming beams or fields of energy, unlike the right foot. I cannot overstate how widespread and horrific this high-tech form of crime has become. The photo on the left shows a second-degree burn that Patrick received to the area around his collarbone while sleeping as a result of his being targeted on an ongoing basis in North Carolina. Patrick reported that, all of a sudden, it felt like he was hit by a searing, thermally painful beam from some kind of active denial system-like weapon. The middle photo shows a horrifying radiation burn on Melissa's back, which she received from an energy weapon attack in Oklahoma. You can even make out the sharply defined elliptical edge of the cylindrical radio wave beam that hit her back. The photo at the right shows an atrocious non-ionizing radiation burn that James received in Oregon over a large part of his upper body. This burn consists of peculiar, meandering, vermiform patches of light-colored, depigmented skin that almost looks white, alternating with erythematous, red patches of inflamed, essentially sunburned skin. The very same characteristic radio wave burns have been witnessed or documented by many other victims of electronic harassment. Look how brutal and disgusting these crimes are. It is totally unacceptable that anybody is getting away with perpetrating these kinds of horrific, covert crimes in our society. Electronic harassment victimization has already grown to the scale of a global criminal atrocity. In addition to the direct acts of electromagnetic assault, battery, and torture, denying this atrocity calling the victims delusional, and refusing to investigate these crimes are all contributing to this modern atrocity. Take a good look at the outcome of this savage energy attack on a woman from Arizona. Doctors with high professionalism and integrity actually diagnose these injuries as radiation burns, and the FBI is aware of this particular assault, just as they're aware of many similar assaults. Yet, law enforcement in the United States, Canada, the European Union, Japan, and many other countries continue to ignore the threat from this growing organized crime. Of all the documented electronic harassment injuries that I've ever seen, these injuries are the most suggestive of classified technology leaked from the military-industrial complex. It looks like a very sophisticated auto-tracking and target-locking system was used to selectively target this person's eyes, possibly with a dual-beam weapon designed to specifically attack the eyes. Think about how serious of a crime it is to leak classified military technology into the hands of organized crime, yet federal authorities are still doing nothing to address this ongoing problem. It's important to point out that radio frequency directed energy weapons can cause many devastating physiological effects without leaving any lesions or other residual traces on the body. These weapons can cause intense pain, devastating seizures, immediate debilitating nausea, severe sleep deprivation, serious cognitive impairment, chronic illness, and more, all without leaving any documentable lesions on the body. When directed energy weapons do cause lesions on the body, these lesions appear minor compared to the intense pain, acute physiological effects, and residual trauma deep inside the body. 
The fact that radio frequency directed energy weapons can produce such severe bioeffects on the body while leaving comparatively minor lesions or no lesions at all is one of the biggest reasons that criminals are getting away with using these weapons with such impunity. Eyes are known to be particularly sensitive to microwave energy. For one thing, eyes have high water content, and microwaves can readily heat water via the dielectric heating effect. Eyes are also poorly equipped to dissipate heat. Furthermore, eyes are anatomically arranged to maximize the capture of electromagnetic radiation. The lenses of the eyes can undergo clouding and crystallization as a result of chronic microwave exposure. In fact, it is documented in the biomedical literature that acute exposure to high-power radio waves for short periods of time can cause blurry vision during the exposure and lead to rapid cataract formation shortly thereafter. I know from first-hand experience that a face-on attack with a large, powerful, radio-frequency directed energy weapon can cause a long-lasting afterimage in the visual field in the exact same pattern as the incoming beam of energy. The effect is similar to the photopigment bleaching that can result from sun gazing, snow blindness, or looking at an arc welder without protective goggles. I made this drawing of an afterimage that was burned into my visual field as a result of a face-on attack from a cannon-sized directed energy weapon at 10 p.m. on December 20th, 2015, into my apartment in the Genesis Tower. In addition to burning my eyes, this attack also caused a large part of my upper body to turn red, as if it were sunburned. A large and very painful lesion of swollen and bruised tissue formed on my sternum, and for two days my heart and aorta felt like they had first-degree burns. At the time of the attack, I was looking through my solarium window at what looked like a beam weapon, deployed on one of the upper balconies of London Place, located at 1177 Hornby Street, as well as a man standing directly behind the device. The afterimage consisted of a central grill-like feature, a crisp pattern of concentric circles, and this horizontal band, which had a curious shattered appearance. I believe that the internal grill-like feature was caused by structural elements at the firing end of the directed energy weapon, which essentially caused a shadow to be cast in the radio waves at the center of the beam. The concentric circles were probably what the cross-section of the beam looked like, as a result of a nested ring waveguide at the firing end of the weapon, much like the waveguide that I pointed out earlier in the talk. I'm not sure what caused the horizontal shattered band in the afterimage. This feature may have resulted from the incoming radio waves being refracted, reflected, and scattered as the beam passed through my window before striking my face and upper body. Three days before this attack, I saw what looked like the very same device in the kitchen area of 1190 Hornby Street, where it was set up in the evening and aimed directly at my apartment. Even though it was after hours, and 1190 Hornby Street is a non-residential building, a large number of people kept coming into the kitchen area, gathering behind the device for a long time, and focusing their attention on me, as I sat in my solarium. For a couple of years before I was directly targeted with organized stalking and electronic harassment, I experienced continual surveillance and a low level of harassment from several dozen people who occupied 1190 Hornby Street almost every night of the week, as well as on most weekends. When criminal organized stalking and electronic harassment was eventually unleashed on me, some of the same stalkers who threatened me and intimidated me elsewhere in Vancouver were individuals that I recognized from 1190 Hornby Street. I routinely observed what looked like stalker training activities inside and on the roof of 1190 Hornby Street. I also saw what looked like a reward system for stalkers by means of wild and sometimes highly ritualized drug-fueled parties that went on for days in 1190 Hornby Street. I'm sure that I'm not the only victim of organized stalking and electronic harassment at the hands of the individuals who constantly inhabited these upper floors of 1190 Hornby Street, after hours and on weekends. Once there was a daytime gathering on this part of the roof of 1190 Hornby Street. I took these photos of that gathering.
I recognize several individuals in these photos who directly participated in harassing me on the streets of Vancouver and from other high-rise buildings in downtown Vancouver. In particular, a lot of visible laser harassment of residents in downtown Vancouver came from the Kettle on Burrard, which is the building in the background at the far right of this photo. The Kettle provides free housing for disadvantaged young adults, many of whom maintain active drug habits, even as they benefit from this free housing. I have good evidence that the harassment network headquartered in 1190 Hornby Street actively recruits drug-addicted young adults living in the Kettle on Burrard to serve as their gang-stalking thugs. I also saw some of the individuals in this photo carrying out illegal voyeurism, surveillance, visual harassment, and intimidation of other residents in downtown Vancouver. At times, I witnessed them aiming what looked like directed energy weapons at my apartment and other apartments in downtown Vancouver. I believe that many of these individuals are part of the leadership of a much larger criminal harassment network in Vancouver, essentially an organized crime syndicate slash domestic terror group. These are extremely violent, sadistic, low-life criminals. They carry out or orchestrate a clean, remote type of violence by means of electronic assaults. Nevertheless, what they're engaged in is sadistic, antisocial behavior involving terror campaigns, criminal physical assaults, and the electromagnetic torture of complete strangers, no doubt for profit. In a couple of ways, these highly disturbed criminals divorce themselves from the true horror of what they perpetrate against ordinary good people. Either they're true psychopaths with no remorse whatsoever for their sadistic acts, or their use of directed energy weapons allows them to both physically and psychologically distance themselves from the horrific consequences of their crimes. Though electronic harassment is very remote and clean from the perpetrator's standpoint, it's violent criminal behavior nonetheless, which violates many serious laws that are already in effect. The criminal sociopaths shown here are only a small part of a much larger crime group operating in and around Vancouver, though I'm confident that individuals shown here are close to the upper echelons of that crime group. This organized crime syndicate is very real, so it warrants being named. A good working name is the Vancouver Microwave Terror Organization, or VMTO. The kitchen area of 1190 Hornby Street, where I first saw the cannon-sized device being aimed at my apartment, is located a few meters over here. In this aerial photograph, the kitchen area that I'm referring to is right here. My apartment, located here, was directly across the alley, at the same elevation as the kitchen area and outdoor patio, which I showed you in the previous photograph. I kept a journal of notes throughout the terror campaign of electromagnetic assaults perpetrated against me by the Vancouver Microwave Terror Group. When I first saw what looked like a cannon-sized beam weapon being aimed at me from the kitchen area of 1190 Hornby Street, I called it the Vortex Gun in my notes. I later realized that this device resembled a directional high-power microwave generator, or HPM generator for short. The very next morning after I first saw the HPM generator being aimed at my apartment, I noticed that it had been removed from the kitchen area of 1190 Hornby Street. Several hours later, a device that looked identical to that HPM generator was deployed on one of the upper balconies of London Place, approximately here. While it was on that balcony, the device was mostly, but not always, covered with a tarp. Using a pair of binoculars, I still got several good looks at the device, so I could tell that it appeared to be the exact same high-power microwave generator that was aimed at me from the kitchen area of 1190 Hornby Street. I could also tell that the cannon-like device was once again aimed at my apartment. Two days after I first noticed the HPM device on the balcony of 1177 Hornby Street, I was brutally attacked twice with high-power beams of energy while I was in the solarium of my apartment. One attack happened at 6 a.m. while I was seated at my desk looking at my computer. The other attack happened the same day at 10 p.m. while I was looking directly at the HPM generator, or vortex gun as I called it, and the man standing behind it, on the balcony of London Place. 
In desperation, I heavily steamed up my apartment because I wanted to fog up the windows to make it harder for the assailant in London Place and the onlookers in 1190 Hornby Street to see my position in my apartment. In the event of a subsequent attack, I wanted to bleed off the static electricity that felt like it permeated my apartment and my body during these energy attacks. When the fog reached my solarium window, it revealed two stable beam marks in the glass, right where I had been sitting and standing during these assaults. These beam marks were brand new stable features in the glass. My solarium window had been fogged up many times in the past, and I had never seen these two marks before this particular occasion. However, after these attacks, I saw the same two marks every time I steamed up my apartment again, right up to the point when I fled Canada for my life one month later. I believe it's quite possible that the two beam marks were permanently flash-burned and frozen into the glass as a result of these electromagnetic attacks. In fact, this forensic evidence may still be present in the solarium window of apartment 1501 at 1189 Howe Street. I think that the two radio wave beams that hit me actually changed the dielectric properties of the glass, such that they made the glass more hydrophobic wherever the high-energy radio waves passed through the glass. As a result, the glass permanently became less conducive to the condensation of fog in the cross-sections of the radio wave beams. Not only were the marks identical to each other, they were also identical to the long-lasting afterimage that had been burned into my visual field as a result of the second attack. Each beam mark had a diameter of 30 centimeters. If you take careful measurements on the beam marks, you'll actually find that they are slight ellipses rather than perfect circles. When a cylindrical beam intersects a plane, it only produces a circular cross-section if the beam hits the plane at a 90-degree angle. If a cylindrical beam passes through a plane at an oblique angle, the intersection of the beam and the plane will be an ellipse, which is what these two beam marks in my window are, slight ellipses. In fact, the shapes of these ellipses are consistent with the position of the cannon-sized beam weapon on the balcony of London Place relative to the position and orientation of my solarium window. Furthermore, the beam marks bear a striking resemblance to a concentric ring resonator waveguide, much like this example from Figure 1 of patent number US6573813B1. This waveguide and similar split-ring resonator waveguides are well-suited to directing millimeter waves, microwaves, and other frequencies of radio waves into cylindrical beams of weaponized electromagnetic radiation. In short, it seems that these long-lasting marks, visualizable in the pattern of fog condensation on glass, are smoking gun forensic traces of directed energy assaults through glass. At the same time, it seems very likely that not all directed energy assaults are expected to leave crisp, round beam cross-sections in glass, like the ones I photographed in Vancouver. Special conditions may be required for that to happen, such as rigidly fixed aim, rather than strafing, a minimum surface power density, and perhaps even specific microwave or radio wave frequency compositions. I already summarized many of the less exotic effects of electronic harassment commonly reported by TIs. I also told you that my thorough review of the biomedical literature revealed at least some evidence, two ample amounts of evidence, that all of these less exotic effects can be produced by weaponized radio frequency energy. Now I'd like to consider the three most commonly reported exotic effects of electronic harassment from a biomedical scientist's perspective. First, let me consider auditory effects, which are reported in some form or another by the majority of electronic harassment victims during assaults, including the diplomats in Cuba. It may surprise you to know that it has been rigorously demonstrated scientifically that humans and other mammals, such as dogs and cats, can hear modulated microwave signals. In fact, aside from the dielectric heating effect, which we are all familiar with from the operation of our microwave ovens, the microwave auditory effect is the most widely accepted biological effect of microwave radiation. There is a large scientific literature on the microwave auditory effect. The papers listed here represent only a small sampling of that literature. 
I want to point out this 2018 paper by Professor James C. Lin, published in the IEEE Microwave Magazine and titled, Strange Reports of Weaponized Sound in Cuba. In his paper, Professor Lin writes the following in regards to the so-called mysterious sonic attacks in Cuba. Quote, Assuming that the reported events are reliable, there is actually a scientific explanation for the source of sonic energy. It could well be from a targeted beam of high-power microwave pulse radiation. Unquote. Given the decades of research that have been done on the microwave auditory effect since it was discovered by Alan Fry and others in the late 1950s and early 1960s, we have a very solid understanding of how modulated microwaves are heard. The mechanism is quite simple, in fact. To explain this mechanism, I want to first orient you to some anatomical aspects of the brain and auditory system. This is a horizontal MRI section of a person's head, showing the brainstem and cerebellum. This person's face is pointing up in this scan, and the back of their head is pointing down. The horizontal MRI section is at the level of the junction between the medulla oblongata and pons, right about here. At that level, you can see the eighth cranial nerve entering the brainstem. This nerve conveys vestibular information from the semicircular canals on each side of the head, located here and here, as well as auditory information from the cochlea on each side of the head, located here and here. The cochlea is where different frequencies of sound waves are transduced into nerve impulses, which are conveyed to the brain by the eighth cranial nerve and perceived as sounds. The soft tissue of the rest of the brain sits above this section. When a burst of sufficiently powerful microwaves passes into the head, it rapidly heats the soft tissues of the brain by a very tiny amount. At microwave power levels well below those that cause thermal pain, the temperature of the brain rises by one millionth of a degree Celsius in just a few microseconds. When this happens, the brain tissue expands a minuscule amount. After the burst of microwaves ends, the brain rapidly cools back down to normal body temperature and the brain tissue contracts accordingly. The thermoelastic expansion and contraction of the brain tissue causes a pressure wave in the brain that propagates to the cochlea on each side of the head, primarily by bone conduction through the skull. After these mechanical waves reach the cochlea, they are perceived as sound in the normal way. In fact, they are actual sounds, but the sounds are thermally generated inside the brain and then propagate to the cochlea along an inside-out pathway, rather than by the outside-in pathway that sound normally follows when it is heard. A single burst of microwaves can be heard as a single click or knocking sound. Microwave energy with a more complex modulation pattern can be heard as more complex sounds. A simple illustration of signal modulation may help you understand this. Microwaves oscillate at hundreds of millions to hundreds of billions of times per second. In this diagram, you can think of the blue wave as being a carrier wave of microwave energy. Microwave frequencies are way above the frequency range for hearing by humans or any other animal for that matter. However, microwaves can be pulsed or otherwise modulated at frequencies that are within the frequency range of human hearing. This figure shows a sine wave envelope for amplitude modulation of the carrier wave. Let's assume that one full cycle of this modulation takes one millisecond, or one thousandth of a second. With this kind of amplitude modulation, the brain tissue would undergo one thousand cycles of heating and cooling each second. One thousand cycles per second is one thousand hertz, or one kilohertz, which is well within the range of human hearing. As a crude reference, the annoying buzzing sound that one of those old digital alarm clocks makes, with the red numbers on its face for hours and minutes, has a peak power around 1 kilohertz. In other words, this kind of microwave signal with a 1 kilohertz amplitude modulation could produce something like a 1 kilohertz tone or buzz that only the person targeted with the microwave beam would hear. Human voices are much more complex sounds since they vary dynamically in amplitude and frequency through time. If the microwave signal is also frequency modulated through time, 
or if the microwave pulse width and pulse repetition rate are varied so that the frequency of brain vibrations varies through time, synthesized voices can be recreated inside a targeted individual's head by this same process. This is what targeted individuals refer to as V2K, or voice to skull. This 1975 paper by Don Justison gives a documented example with an explained protocol by which intelligible words were transmitted into a person's head via the microwave auditory effect, essentially by varying the microwave pulse repetition rate. There is no doubt that the methods for constructing voice-modulated microwave signals have advanced substantially in the 43 years since that paper was published. Once again, it's important to emphasize that the microwave auditory effect, including V2K, can be produced at microwave power densities far below those that leave burns or other lesions on the body, or even those that cause perceptible thermal pain. As I said before, some TIs report experiencing inexplicable visual effects, but generally only at the times and places that they experience repeated bouts of electronic harassment, for example, generally in their homes but nowhere else. These induced visual effects are reported as being most common and most prominent under low light conditions or in complete darkness. The visual effects may even be perceived with the eyes closed as if the energy responsible for them can pass right through one's closed eyelids in addition to one's walls. Reported visual harassment of this kind includes faint flashes of light, slowly swirling greenish coronal discharges which look like small versions of the aurora borealis, and balls of faint red light that seem to slowly advance toward or recede from the targeted person. The visual effects can also include fields of countless points of faint monochromatic flickering light, much like the quote-unquote snow on an old television set, which isn't receiving a proper signal, as depicted here. This effect is often best seen in flat, reflective metallic surfaces, such as baking sheets, mirrors, the enameled outer shells of metal appliances, and the outer shells of stainless steel refrigerators. Monochromatic moving images can be partially incorporated into these television snow-like patterns, similar to crude black-and-white movies on old television sets. Shadowy figures can be made to slowly sweep or glide across one's ceiling or walls, or they can be made to appear to loom out of the walls, again mostly when the lights are low or completely off. According to other reports, faint but high-resolution holograms can become incorporated into, or overlaid on top of, pictures, paintings, wall hangings, window reflections, or wallpaper patterns. Targeted individuals who experience these effects report that the nature of these images are typically what one might expect from the pathological mind of a sadistic, psychopathic teenager bent on harassing others. Unlike with the microwave auditory effect and V2K, my review of the biomedical literature revealed no published evidence on the stimulation of the visual system by modulated microwaves or other frequencies of radio waves. However, it did reveal information supporting a tentative hypothesis for photoreceptor stimulation by modulated radio frequency signals, which is plausible from a neuroscientific standpoint. There is scientific evidence that radio frequency energy can affect voltage-gated calcium channels. Professor Martin Paul of Washington State University reviewed this evidence in papers published in the Journal of Cellular and Molecular Medicine and the Journal of Chemical Neuroanatomy. Voltage-gated calcium channels are widely distributed throughout the body. These ion channels play key roles in the contraction of skeletal muscles, smooth muscles, and heart muscle, the transmission of signals between nerve cells, the secretion of hormones from glands, and several other bioelectrochemical processes. In fact, the coupling effects between radio frequency energy and voltage-gated calcium channels, and possibly other types of voltage-gated ion channels as well, may be the central mechanisms underlying the so-called non-thermal bioeffects of radio waves. In the eye, sensory cells, or photoreceptors called rods and cones, transduce incoming visible light signals into cascades of electrochemical events. 
Voltage-gated calcium channels are a critical part of the mechanism by which these photoreceptor cells pass that transduced sensory information to the first neurons, labeled 3, along the ascending visual pathway. It seems plausible that certain modulated radio wave signals might have weak effects on voltage-gated calcium channels in rods and cones, and that these effects might produce perceptual visual experiences, especially when the activities of the rods and cones are little affected by visible light. The functioning of rods and cones is optimized to electromagnetic radiation in the visible frequency band, in other words, to visible light. Therefore, under bright visible light, the weaker effects of modulated radio waves may tend to get swamped out by normal visual stimuli. This may explain why the bizarre visual anomalies and other visual effects experienced by many TIs tend to happen in the dark or with the eyes closed. It's also scientifically plausible that the types of photoreceptors stimulated and the intensity of that stimulation depend on the modulation pattern of the incoming radio waves. Perhaps non-public domain researchers, from DARPA for example, figured out how to spatially encode a beamed image coordinate system with different patterns of RF signal modulation in order to stimulate photoreceptors in an image forming pattern, possibly even in perceived colors. Projecting an image encoded beam via a spatially dependent pattern of radio wave modulation may be trivial nowadays. For example, imagine that the image shown here is being beamed onto a screen by a PowerPoint projector or similar projection system. Obviously, a projector of this kind can encode different hues and intensities of visible light at different coordinates in the projected beam. We all know that the projected light can also be made to change dynamically to create video images or motion pictures. To recap, there's good scientific evidence that microwaves and other frequencies of radio waves can have coupling effects on the activities of voltage-gated calcium channels. These ion channels function in vision, muscle contraction, the beating of the heart, the transfer of nerve impulses through the nervous system, the secretion of hormones from glands, and many other bioelectrochemical processes. I have described a hypothetical scenario in which appropriately tuned modulations of radio waves might influence the rods and cones in the eye, especially under low light conditions. I want to be perfectly clear that this hypothesis is only informed speculation at present. There is no publicly available scientific literature documenting stimulation of the visual system by modulated microwaves or radio waves. At the same time, many credible individuals have independently reported through-wall visual effects, like the ones I've described, during their electronic harassment, and my hypothesis is plausible from a neuroscientific standpoint. Accordingly, I encourage scientists to consider how these through-wall visual effects might be accomplished by modulated radio waves. If these effects are in fact proven, then certain radio frequency devices may very well be capable of visual forms of extremely invasive psychological harassment, terror campaigns, and even psychological torture, especially with unsuspecting victims. Constantly beaming images through the walls of a target's home and even through their closed eyelids could allow for subliminal suggestion and even dream manipulation in ways that ordinary people would find very difficult to escape, even in what should be the sanctity of their own homes. Before moving on to the costs of electronic harassment, I'd like to say a few words about claims that electronic harassment is capable of thought extraction, including remote neural monitoring, seeing through a target's eyes, hearing through a target's ears, or reading one's mind. If you search the internet, you may even encounter an allegation from a self-proclaimed insider who claimed to have worked for a security company involved in contract stalking and electronic harassment that he once encountered a bank of monitors with live video feeds directly from the eyes of several targeted individuals. I have to say that there's no scientific basis or even plausible scientific hypothesis for the remote monitoring of one's thoughts or the remote extraction of high-resolution perceptual information directly from targeted individuals' auditory and visual systems. An article by retired Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Thomas, titled The Mind Has No Firewall, helped spread the view that psychotronic weapons are capable of reading targeted individuals' minds. This article was published in 1998 in Parameters, a quarterly academic journal published by the United States Army War College. The title of this article was influential in promoting the notion that remote mind reading is possible by means of high-tech electromagnetic devices. 
The text of this article focuses mostly on the vulnerability of the body's electrochemical systems, mainly the muscles, senses, and nervous system, to being influenced or disrupted by energy weapons. The article briefly mentions research that was being done in Russia on psychotronic weapons, purportedly capable of remotely extracting information from a person's brain. But the main focus of the article is on the potentially disruptive effects of energy inputs into the nervous systems of targeted individuals. Many of these deleterious input effects are well substantiated. They are the very same effects that thousands upon thousands of targeted individuals are now experiencing at the hands of electronic harassment networks and, as the paper calls them, psycho-terrorists. Unfortunately, the bold declaration in the title of the paper implies that the mind has no firewall with regard to both remote inputs into the mind and remote outputs or downloads from the mind. This is a gross overstatement of what is possible. While it's true that the mind has no firewall against many debilitating effects and even some mentally influencing effects of directed energy weapons, there are severe biological and physical constraints on the remote extraction of information from the mind. In other words, a much fairer, though much less catchy title would be, The Unshielded Mind Has No Firewall Against Certain Unwanted Intrusions from Energy Weapons, but severe constraints act as an intrinsic firewall against the remote extraction of mental processes. Let me explain what I mean by this more accurate, qualified title. Put simply, there are severe physical and biological limitations to the remote sensing of mental processes. What do I mean by this? We all know that information on brain structure can be obtained non-invasively from living subjects using imaging technology situated outside the head, such as computed tomography or CT scanners, and magnetic resonance imaging or MRI machines. Information on brain function can also be gathered using sensors positioned outside the head, as in the case of functional MRI, or fMRI, and electroencephalography, or EEG. fMRI measures brain activity by measuring changes in blood flow across a three-dimensional map of brain voxels. The resulting data looks something like this. This pattern of frontal cortex activation was obtained when subjects were simultaneously shown words describing emotions and photos of people with facial expressions that were incongruent with those words. EEG records voltage fluctuations at many different points around the skull, each of which represents the summed external potentials of a huge number of nearby neurons. The resulting data look like this. This EEG trace is dominated by sinusoidal-like waves with frequencies around 11 Hz, in other words, alpha waves, which are most prominent in the occipital lobes. This pattern of electrical activity in the brain normally arises during wakeful relaxation with the eyes closed. Clearly, patterns of brain activity at certain levels of resolution can be detected using sensors positioned outside the brain. I don't dispute this. There is also technology in use that can detect electric biosignals in the brain, muscles, nerves, and eyes that indicate active perception, volitional effort, and so forth. These biosignals form the basis of very impressive human-machine interface technologies. I don't dispute these capabilities. However, the ability to record patterns of brain, nerve, and muscle activity drops off rapidly with increasing distance between the sensing equipment and the brain being functionally imaged or recorded. Even when imaging and recording the brain under optimal conditions, like those shown here, the resulting data don't come close to capturing our high-resolution thoughts and perceptions. Put simply, the data shown here are not thoughts. They're just crude representations of brain activity patterns. Moreover, human-machine interface technology based on electric biosignals relies on sensors that are in close proximity to the body, and the signals that are detected by this technology are much simpler than our thoughts. Neuroscience is barely scratching the surface on understanding human thoughts. Modern neuroscience doesn't even have a working theory of the mind. The physical constraints on the remote sensing of neural processes that I'm talking about have to do with the rapid reduction in signal-to-noise ratio with increasing distance between the sensor and subject, 
when it comes to magnetic fields and electric potentials. In addition, biological constraints on the remote sensing of neural processes arise from the extraordinary complexity of the brain, with its 86 billion neurons or so, and the fact that they are connected into an irregular three-dimensional network. This three-dimensional network of the brain is already apparent at a macroscopic scale, as seen in this diffusion tensor MRI scan, which maps major white matter tracks in the brain by how axons affect the diffusion of water through the brain. In this image, red is used to code connections running left to right or right to left. Green indicates front to back or back to front connections, and blue indicates connections running up and down. There are reports in the media suggesting that, by means of this same imaging technique, doctors found evidence of white matter damage in the brains of the diplomats who were victims of the mysterious energy attacks in Cuba. The three-dimensional network of the brain shown here becomes progressively more intricate and irregular at smaller and smaller scales. Our perceptions, thoughts, and intentions depend on the dynamic activity of this amazingly complex three-dimensional neural network. Brain activity measured inside any given voxel, or the field potential measured at any given point outside the brain, represent the summed activity of a multitude of neurons, which means that a lot of information about neural processes is inevitably lost during non-invasive recording methods. Not only does this place severe biological constraints on the proximate or remote sensing of neural processes, it also constrains how precisely the brain can be stimulated by outside energy sources, like magnetic fields and modulated radio wave beams. For example, even when a pencil-thin beam of modulated radio waves is locked onto one part of the head, that beam will simultaneously irradiate and possibly stimulate all interconnected neurons along the beam's path with the same pattern of modulated energy. Neural networks involved in perceptions and thoughts are not arranged into nice neat lines or circuit diagrams in the brain. Instead, our thoughts arise from complex activity patterns in highly intricate three-dimensional networks, and these same endogenous activity patterns cannot be reproduced in the brain by outside magnetic fields or beams of electromagnetic radiation, no matter how advanced the technology is. This is not to say that composite patterns of brain activity, such as emotional states and levels of arousal, cannot be strongly influenced by radio frequency energy. They can. Targeted individuals, perpetrators of electronic harassment, and the developers of directed energy weapons in the military-industrial complex know these sinister influences are possible. However, it's important to keep in mind that there are limitations on the types of precise neurophysiological influences that are possible with these devices. Direct thought injection into the brain and mind reading are not possible. In contrast, intricate perceptual effects including perceived sounds and possibly perceived visual effects can be induced with radio frequency energy at the level of the respective sensory organs and not directly in the higher centers of the brain. These effects can be very high resolution and frighteningly real because they're generated at the level of the sensory organs, which are spatially arranged and optimized to precisely encode variable energy inputs. However, the perceptual effects of electronic harassment don't arise from the traditional sources of stimuli, and they can be very subtle. In turn, this can give rise to subliminal suggestion, which can sometimes be experienced as thoughts being injected directly into one's mind. I think it's important for TIs to be aware that direct thought injection and mind reading are not actually happening because this knowledge can help minimize the terrorizing and psychologically torturous aspects of this very sick crime. Don't ever forget that your private thoughts are your own. Nobody can intrude upon them unless you vocalize them or write them down and then there's no longer any guarantee that your thoughts will remain private. In other words, it's a really bad idea for several reasons to engage in open discourse with your V2K. To summarize, radio frequency harassment devices and directed energy weapons are capable of producing a broad suite, or syndrome, of deleterious bioeffects on targeted victims. The precise effects probably depend on the nature of the harassment device or weapon being used, and the way that device is tuned in terms of power output, frequency composition, pulse duration, and modulation pattern. 
There is at least some to ample publicly available documentation that modulated radio frequency energy is capable of producing all but the last two reported bioeffects of electronic harassment listed here. Even though there is no publicly available documentation that modulated radio waves can produce visual perceptual effects, I have formulated a scientifically plausible model for how this might be accomplished with radio frequency energy. When a number of the bioeffects on this list suddenly occur together as syndromes of synchronously correlated effects, suites of these effects can actually point towards radio frequency harassment as the most likely source of these correlated effects. The only commonly reported effect that has no documented support and makes no sense scientifically is the extraction of thoughts or the remote monitoring or downloading of neural processes by means of so-called psychotronic devices or wireless neurotechnology. Still, many credible people report this experience, and I think there's a good reason for that. The feeling that one's mind is being read while under electronic harassment is likely a valid experience for some people on the receiving end of this high-tech form of abuse. It's just that this experience is almost certainly a well-orchestrated illusion by the electronic harassers, or psycho-terrorists, as Timothy Thomas calls them, an electromagnetic sleight of hand, if you will, particularly when a victim's actions, and possibly even their words, are under extreme surveillance, and the victim can be influenced simultaneously by private messages and subliminal suggestions sent via modulated radio frequency signals. For targeted individuals who are abused with V2K technology, it's also possible that it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish one's internal dialogue or inner voice from a voice-modulated signal injected via the microwave auditory effect. This may also facilitate an illusory experience that one's mind is being read, but this is not what's really happening. In addition to thousands upon thousands of people being terrorized and repeatedly criminally assaulted, the socio-criminal phenomena of organized stalking and electronic harassment are probably imposing huge hidden costs on society. I'd like to spend a few minutes exploring those potential costs. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide rates in the U.S. have risen since 1999 for both females and males across all age groups except those aged 75 years and older. I'm not arguing that this increase is mostly attributable to organized stalking and electronic harassment, though the TI community knows for sure that a number of victims have been driven to suicide as a direct result of these atrocious crimes. In other words, it's clear that organized stalking and electronic harassment have made some contribution to this recent increase in suicides. What I am arguing is that law enforcement, other government institutions, and society in general need to start giving these destructive crimes the same kind of serious consideration that they give to well-accepted social problems with far-reaching impacts, like suicide. It behooves the general public and their elected lawmakers to consider the negative impacts that these crimes are having on our economy, as well as their broader costs to society. Everyone should be able to get behind addressing an issue that seriously threatens our economy, as well as the very fabric of our society. The CDC estimates that suicides in the United States in just the year 2013 imposed medical and work loss costs totaling $50.8 billion. Given the thousands of victims complaining of organized stalking and electronic harassment, we know that these crimes also comprise a widespread social problem in the United States, as in many other countries. Unfortunately, we don't even have the crudest of estimates of the potential hidden costs of this socio-criminal phenomenon because the relevant government agencies won't even acknowledge the existence of this rapidly growing problem. Many, if not most, elected representatives at the national level and all of the top leaders in law enforcement know about the existence and pervasiveness of organized stalking and electronic harassment. In a perversion of the rule of law, Apparently, our elected and appointed leaders feel that it's okay to fly blind in the face of these very destructive criminal issues. It should also be obvious to anyone who takes the time to consider the existence of directed energy weapons and the countless documented testimonies and the evidence of victims that these crimes are very real and that their costs to society must be massive. So, what kinds of costs are these crimes inevitably imposing on our society, economically and otherwise? 
What is the list of reasons that we should all be very concerned about organized stalking and electronic harassment, especially when these problems are running amok in our society today? I've omitted the most obvious reason from the list I'm about to show you, that these crimes involve outrageous human rights abuses, criminal harassment, repeated assault and battery, and psychological and physical torture being perpetrated against thousands upon thousands of innocent victims. Clearly, this is reason enough for us to be concerned about these crimes, and for law enforcement to take them seriously. After all, it's the sworn duty and the legal obligation of law enforcement to address serious crimes like these, in order to uphold the law and to protect the safety of the taxpaying public. This goes without saying. In addition, most victims of organized stalking and electronic harassment suffer lost work productivity, and for many, their careers are totally ruined by these crimes. These effects obviously have serious negative impacts on the economy for all of us. Organized stalking and electronic harassment can also break up marriages, destabilize families, ruin social support networks, and utterly destroy lives in many related ways. Families are incredibly valuable social units in society, and we should be very concerned about factors that erode these units. I've already shown you the huge cost that suicides impose on society, and we know that organized stalking and electronic harassment are contributing to an increase in suicide rate. The criminal leaders of electronic harassment rings are probably making heaps of money from this high-tech form of intimidation and assault via racketeering activities. Racketeering is bad for the economy, costly for taxpayers, and results in lost revenues for the government. Taxpayers pay the price when victims of organized stalking and electronic harassment with no mental illness are unjustly placed into psychiatric holds, simply for alleging genuine and unimaginably cruel crimes to those charged with protecting citizens from crime. While hospital owners, administrators, and psychiatrists profit from keeping the beds full in psychiatric wards, taxpayers ultimately pay most of the bills, especially in countries with national or provincial health services like the UK and Canada. The unchecked growth of organized stalking and electronic harassment is causing more and more people to lose confidence in the police, other emergency services, health care, and government. Ultimately, this lost confidence will contribute to the erosion of the effectiveness of these important institutions and to the destabilization of society. The last three reasons that we should be very concerned about letting criminals and antisocial lunatics perpetrate organized stalking and electronic harassment with impunity are probably the most important of all. When totally unrestrained, as they currently are, these crimes provide a wide-open gateway to the growth of pervasive corruption, which is terrible for the economy and for the rule of law. In fact, the negligent stance of law enforcement and the government toward these crimes effectively represents subversion of the Constitution and the rule of law. Left unchecked, this will lead either to lawlessness and anarchy, or to a police state with inevitable civil unrest. Either way, loss of respect for the rule of law will ultimately destroy our country. Finally, allowing criminals of all ages to torment, harm, and torture people with directed energy weapons with no fear whatsoever of accountability is a tacit endorsement of sadistic antisocial behavior and violence. As these behaviors become more entrenched in society and are culturally transmitted to future generations, we can safely predict a large spillover effect into other types of crime and violence. In other words, an inevitable crime pandemic. Having profound cultural inertia, this crime pandemic may take decades to undo unless we start taking decisive action now. I'll wrap up my presentation by commenting on some issues related to the hard road to exposure and justice with respect to these elusive yet highly destructive crimes. First, let's consider the extraordinarily rapid growth of technology in our modern world. Real and imagined technology can be assigned to one of three categories. The internal yellow oval on this diagram represents in-use technology that is widely known by the general public. This category is largely filled with consumer technology, which we use in our everyday lives and see advertised on television and in other mainstream media. There is also a huge amount of real technology in existence that is outside most people's knowledge. 
This category includes highly specialized technology that is only used and even known by people working in narrow technical fields, such as specialist engineers, scientists, and physicians, as well as the suppliers of equipment for these disciplines. As time goes by, more and more real technology is falling into this orange category, simply because it's too complex for the average, untrained person to understand or even grasp. Long gone are the days when Renaissance individuals had good working knowledge of all technology in existence at the time. Nowadays, no single person has an excellent understanding of all available technology. Of course, this orange category also includes the burgeoning classified tech that's in use by militaries and the intelligence agencies, some of which is likely falling into the hands of organized crime. Any technology that's dreamt up or mentioned culturally, but cannot exist due to the limitations of what's possible, or doesn't yet exist but may someday, falls into a third category, labeled science fiction in this figure. Obviously, the tools used by criminals for their illegal tradecraft often come from the yellow category of in-use technology that's known by the general public. But I think we can safely assume that more and more, criminals are using methods and tools from the orange category of tech in use outside the average person's knowledge. The reason is that this kind of technology makes it easier for criminals to get away with their crimes, especially because most police officers lack technical expertise or advanced educations. Along with the victims, perpetrators, and law enforcement, psychiatry is also on the front lines of organized stalking and electronic harassment. It's not as if the victims of these crimes are generally seeking help from psychiatrists. After all, organized stalking and electronic harassment are very serious crimes, first and foremost. Victims know this all too well, since they are on the receiving end of these crimes. Nevertheless, many victims are dragged in front of psychiatrists against their will simply for making allegations about these very real and very disgusting crimes. Unfortunately, psychiatry is failing in some important ways in relation to the rapid expansion of technology. Psychiatrists are often heavily biased by their own limited knowledge of what constitutes real technology and what should be relegated to science fiction. Aside from knowing about the effects of psychotropic drugs, most psychiatrists do not have substantially more advanced expertise in specialized areas of technology than average people in the general population. Yet, many psychiatrists boast inflated egos, and some get off on an entitled sense of power. While the orange crescent in this figure is quite wide in reality, and growing wider every day, in practice many psychiatrists act as if this category of technology is narrow or non-existent. If these psychiatrists personally don't know about the use of advanced technology for nefarious purposes, they completely rule out the existence of all such technology when making diagnoses, which result in people having their freedom taken away, their personal relationships harmed, and their future testimony discredited. If a person on an involuntary psych hold tells a psychiatrist about harassment and assault by means of advanced technology, which is outside the psychiatrist's knowledge, a diagnosis of delusion is almost inevitable under the flawed psychiatric approach in practice today. This is a very serious problem. This issue must be addressed if we're going to effectively combat organized stalking and electronic harassment, because the flawed diagnostic method of modern psychiatry fuels these crimes and gives the criminals the perfect cover. Currently, psychiatry is unwittingly, or perhaps wittingly in some cases, facilitating this atrocity. Being on the front lines of this issue, there's no excuse for psychiatry not to be one of the first institutions to take constructive, proactive steps with regard to this serious socio-criminal issue. If the current criteria of psychiatric diagnosis cannot distinguish delusion from the outcome of genuine abuse, then what good are those criteria? And... What other diagnostic criteria might also be fundamentally flawed in much the same way? I think it's well within the current capabilities of psychiatry to overcome this dilemma by overhauling and modernizing their diagnostic criteria and methods, and by waking up and finally stepping into the 21st century with respect to their understanding of the technologies of psychological harassment and abuse. Even now, an ethical and professional psychiatrist needs to only take a few extra minutes of time to speak with the person in front of them, and to acknowledge that it's not possible to know all criminal methods and nefarious technology in existence in order to make sound diagnoses.
Sadly, given how things have been going, it won't be surprising if psychiatry continues to stubbornly refuse to acknowledge organized stalking and electronic harassment, even as many psychiatrists have seen dramatic growth in the allegations of these crimes. If psychiatry's response to this human rights atrocity is recalcitrant or delayed, coming only after an angry public forces reform, the profession's reputation and stature will suffer irreparable harm if it hasn't done so already. So, psychiatry's role in empowering organized stalking and electronic harassment is one major issue that we need to deal with if we are to effectively combat these crimes. Another key issue is deniability. In fact, deniability is the very essence of what makes directed energy weapons so dangerous to stable, just societies, and why we should all be very concerned about the rapid growth in the use of these weapons in civilian settings. This sinister feature of radio frequency directed energy weapons is well known to just about everyone who has written about, worked on, or thought carefully about these weapons. It's certainly well known to the thousands and thousands of victims of directed energy assaults, including the U.S. and Canadian diplomats who were attacked with energy weapons in Cuba. Deniability is so high with these devices because radio waves are silent and invisible. In addition, little to no durable forensic evidence is left behind when radio frequency directed energy weapons are used to harm or disable targets, human or otherwise. Certainly, the criminals who use these devices profit greatly from this inherent deniability. There's so much intrinsic deniability surrounding these weapons that people who don't want to be bothered by the difficulties of dealing with electronic harassment can flat out deny a problem which they know very well exists. Law enforcement, government institutions charged with protecting public safety, human rights organizations, politicians, psychiatrists, and other physicians all have the option of denying that these weapons are being used to harm people in civilian settings, simply because they would rather not deal with this tricky problem, or because doing so might threaten their careers or profits. This double-sided deniability of directed energy weapons was already clear to Dr. Stephen Metz and Lt. Col. James Kivett of the U.S. Army War College, who wrote an essay in 1994 titled The Revolution in Military Affairs and Conflict Short of War. In their paper, the authors wrote, quote, The advantage of directed energy weapons over conventional ones is deniability. Against whom is such deniability aimed? Certainly not the narco-traffickers, who will quickly recognize that interception by the DEA or military planes leads to loss of their aircraft. Instead, deniability must be aimed at the American people, who do not sanction the imprisonment, much less execution, of individuals without a trial." Unquote. The scenario involving the Drug Enforcement Agency and Central American narco-traffickers was fictitious, according to the authors. Yet their position on deniability was insightful and accurate, and it is shared by many other experts on radio frequency directed energy weapons. By design, organized stalking is also a crime with high intrinsic deniability. Clearly, the ease of denial by both criminals and law enforcement alike is fueling the rapid growth of organized stalking and electronic harassment. When police officers lacking integrity become aware of the high deniability of directed energy weapons and of the unwritten policies of their departments to not investigate electronic harassment because of that deniability, those corruptible police officers are emboldened to aid and abet the electronic harassment networks in their local communities, no doubt for kickbacks. That's how dangerous the deniability of directed energy weapons is, in addition to the institutionalized inaction of law enforcement when it comes to the crimes of organized stalking and electronic harassment. In very general terms, for the purpose of this talk, the trick to countering deniability will be to make the use of directed energy weapons less covert and more visible, so to speak. In other words, we need to come up with clever ways to make the use of these weapons less deniable. We can make positive steps in this direction with the following. Better educated, better equipped, and higher integrity law enforcement. Development of residual environmental markers and forensic biomarkers for radio frequency assaults. Further development and wider use of RF sensing and recording technologies. And the acceptance of victim-generated data of this kind by the courts. Another big issue that stands in the way of exposure and justice is the sheer complexity and novelty of this socio-criminal phenomenon. 
The socio-criminal issue of people being targeted with organized stalking and electronic harassment is what's known as a wicked problem. Wicked problems are multi-layered, socially complex problems that resist resolution and often don't have clear solutions. Wicked problems include those that can only be solved if large numbers of people change their attitudes and behavior. Examples of wicked problems are problems in social planning, economic policy, global climate change, environmental degradation of the oceans, pandemic diseases, burgeoning population growth, drug trafficking, nuclear weapons, and social injustice, including organized stalking and electronic harassment, which are new social injustices of global proportions. In some ways, it's understandable how the government and law enforcement might feel like their hands are tied when it comes to grappling with organized stalking and electronic harassment. Huge numbers of quote-unquote ordinary people are being lured into committing these disgusting crimes, probably because they can feel anonymous in doing so, and there's so little chance of getting caught. Electronic harassment is a crime that produces little to no demonstrable physical evidence. How are law enforcement and the courts to deal with a crime like this, especially when the crime has become so prevalent? A popular ancient Roman expression comes to mind when I think about how non-corrupted government officials who know about this socio-criminal phenomenon might feel. Oribus tineo lupum. I hold a wolf by the ears. This expression refers to a very dangerous no-win situation in which either holding on or letting go could produce disastrous results. If the government lets go of the wolf's ears and begins openly addressing electronic harassment, in other words, begins facing the wolf, the government will have to acknowledge a serious criminal threat to public safety and the rule of law, which it may have very little capacity to control at present. If the government continues holding the wolf's ears, in other words, continues denying there's a problem, doing nothing to stop it, and effectively giving the perpetrators free reign to carry out their crimes with impunity, then the wolf is guaranteed to continue growing. That wolf is the organized socio-criminal problem of electronic harassment, which is often assisted by the criminal tactic of organized stalking. If anyone takes just a moment to think about this potential conundrum, even from the government's point of view, one of the alternatives is clearly the better course of action. Obviously, we should let go of the wolf's ears now and face the menace head-on immediately. Thousands upon thousands of taxpaying Americans are being illegally persecuted, assaulted, and often tortured, and the costs of this criminality to society are mounting fast. Extreme human rights abuses are being perpetrated against many innocent citizens. Microwave terrorists, or so-called psycho-terrorists, are posing genuine, community-level terrorism threats and carrying out those threats wantonly inside our country. This is going on right now in our country, as well as many other countries in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. Given the purported values of our country, this rampant crime spree of persecution and microwave terrorism should be totally unacceptable to our government and to law enforcement now, as it certainly is to the thousands of victims of these horrific crimes. It should also be crystal clear to the relevant government institutions that this problem will be way easier to begin dealing with now compared to five years, ten years, or twenty years down the road. The wolf is a rambunctious, menacing adolescent now compared to the full-grown, rampaging, alpha male dire wolf that this problem will soon grow into. In the long run, it will save a massive amount of taxpayer-funded government resources to start dealing with this problem sooner than later. The reason is that, as time goes by, those who perpetrate or aid and abet organized stalking and electronic harassment are infiltrating further and further into social and government institutions, including law enforcement, other emergency services, and possibly even health care and the courts. As the number of perpetrators inside these institutions grows, they will have more power to corruptly impede investigations into dangerous organized crime groups. In addition, not dealing with the socio-criminal problem now is enculturating more and more young people into the attitudes and methods of community-level microwave terrorism. In actuality, the FBI has the equipment and expertise to begin dealing with this real terrorism threat today. They certainly receive enough taxpayer funding to carry out anti-terrorism law enforcement activities to protect taxpaying Americans from a real threat today. There should be no excuse for inaction on this. 
Unfortunately for the rule of law, because of the deniability factor of directed energy weapons, government institutions are succumbing to the temptation of completely ignoring or denying this problem, even as many citizens are being tortured with electromagnetic weapons, and some are being incarcerated in psychiatric hospitals when they reach out to law enforcement for help. There is an effective strategy that law enforcement and the Justice Department could begin implementing now, and that strategy is deterrence. It's obvious that organized stalking and electronic harassment will not stop unless the criminal leaders and orchestrating perpetrators know the genuine threat of extreme criminal penalties. The sociopathic perpetrators of these crimes seem to get a huge thrill out of secretly harming others. Many of them even seem addicted to voyeuristically watching others and terrorizing and abusing them through organized stalking and electronic harassment. The perpetrators are emboldened by the institutionalized silence and inaction of law enforcement on these serious criminal issues. The perpetrators simply will not stop unless they face the real threat of exposure and severe legal consequences. The FBI and similar law enforcement agencies around the world have the capability of successfully investigating perpetrators of these sorts of crimes. It certainly gets the attention of the FBI when criminals attempt to build and use potentially lethal ionizing radiation directed energy weapons, such as Eric J. Fate, pictured above, and Glendon Scott Crawford, below. These men were sentenced to 8 and 30 years, respectively, even though they never acted on their plot to use a homemade weapon modified from an industrial-grade X-ray machine against would-be victims. Although radio frequency directed energy weapons are much less harmful on a single assault basis, perpetrators of electronic harassment with such devices actually carry out repeated assaults on their victims, day in and day out, sometimes for years on end. The result is a very serious form of psychological and physical no-touch torture with devices that have deleterious effects on the victim's long-term health. From what we've gleaned about the energy attacks in Cuba, these forms of assault can potentially produce permanent hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, and probably other permanently crippling effects as well. Based on the reports of targeted individuals, perpetrators of electronic harassment sometimes carry out potentially deadly attacks. For example, attempting to incapacitate a victim while she or he is driving a motor vehicle. Induced heart attacks and strokes are also possible outcomes of radiofrequency directed energy assaults. The perpetrators of electronic harassment carry out brutally painful and dangerous attacks with complete disregard for the safety, health, and even life of their victims, which include women and men, girls and boys, the elderly and infirm, persons with disabilities, small children, and even pregnant mothers carrying babies. The mentally deranged criminals who carry out electronic harassment are also known to sadistically torture people's pets and farm animals. Animal rights advocates should be outraged about this. The sociopaths at the tops of electronic harassment networks who are actively ordering, orchestrating, and arming these assaults and terror campaigns today against many victims simultaneously deserve much more severe punishments than Crawford and Fate, who never carried out their directed energy plot. The criminal leaders and orchestrating perpetrators of electronic harassment deserve life in prison as well as the forfeiture of their assets for the extreme human rights abuses that they're actually carrying out on a daily basis with complete disregard for life and the rule of law. The FBI, RCMP, and similar national law enforcement agencies around the world cannot go after all the organized stalking and electronic harassment networks in their respective countries at once. Instead, they should select one or two of the largest and most dangerous groups of this kind and go after them with the standard techniques used to take down organized crime, including infiltration with undercover agents and the use of confidential informants. A few of the top criminals need to feel the sting of lifetime prison sentences and the forfeiture of their assets. As news of these consequences spreads through the dark underworld of organized stalking and electronic harassment, and the criminals see some of their colleagues doing perp walks and chains for the first time, many of them will be strongly deterred from engaging in these crimes any further. Law enforcement action against a few of the leading perpetrators needs to be swift and decisive, and the penalties need to be severe for this deterrence to be effective. Strong deterrence of this kind will work. 
In fact, with elusive and pervasive crimes like organized stalking and electronic harassment, deterrence is the most effective counter-strategy. Inaction is not acceptable. Thousands of victims have been asking for help for years, and the number of victims is only growing larger by the day. The lives of taxpaying citizens are on the line. Respect for the rule of law is at stake. The safety and stability of free democratic societies are ultimately under threat from this new socio-criminal problem. When will law enforcement start doing its job? What kind of futures will our children have if these perverse crimes are allowed to continue unchecked? To the victims of these crimes, I say, it's time to step up our game and be more vocal than ever that what's happening is outrageous and unjust. It's time to hold law enforcement accountable for not dealing with this problem. To the low-level perpetrators of these crimes, who still retain a shred of their humanity, I say, it's time to defect from these criminal organizations and disclose what you know about them. Start showing the same courage and integrity that the victims do. A world with rampant organized stalking and electronic harassment won't be good in the end for you, your children, and the other people you love. Keep documentation and evidence of the crimes you've witnessed, and use that evidence for good when the time is right. That time is coming soon. Start doing the right thing and regain your freedom and dignity. For those who were unaware of these crimes, it's time to wake up and start getting concerned about the threats from organized stalking and electronic harassment. These crimes could be unleashed on you at any time. The government and law enforcement have done nothing to stop these crimes, and you should be very concerned about that kind of negligence by the institutions that your tax dollars fund. Victims of organized stalking and electronic harassment have been fighting by themselves thus far. Not only for themselves, but also for the rest of society. It's time to start helping them in this shared battle. We're all in this together whether you know it yet or not. We all need to fight for the most important human rights issue of the 21st century. Thank you.